Okay, so, um, like Fabian mentioned already, I've been doing a number of tools um, in testing, PyTest, and then after some time I decided, okay, um, there's this whole thing about unit tests and PyTest and nose tests and whatnot. And actually it would be nice to have a really uh, unifying experience uh, when running tests against the Python application, so that's why I went for also writing talks, which is kind of like a meta test runner, and that can actually invoke nose tests or unit tests or pi test. And after a while I thought, yeah, that's all very nice, but the real problem is when you want to have something like quality assurance in your projects is really also about release management. So you actually have several packages, dependencies, and I have that with my own open source projects, but also with people I, and companies I consult for. And that's why I also went for basically the next level, to have something that manages the packages then also, that also get tested. But all the time coming very much from this kind of like QA and testing perspective. So that's when DevPy actually um, was born. The, DevPy system is basically there to help you with PyPy related release workflows and quality assurance. It currently consists in, in version 2.0 of three main components, which is the core DevP server. I'm going to talk about all of these components in detail. The, the server that actually provides the, the PyPy caching index and your private indexes where you might not actually want to publish from, but you actually want to use that within your organization. It, um, the recently released is the DevPy web plugin, which um, provides web um, interfaces also for your documentation, a few other things, and search across metadata and documentation. And then there's the third thing that you don't have to use actually, but it's um, helpful if you have to deal with development and production indexes and so on. And that's a command line tool that basically drives the well-known other um, tools like pip and easy install and um, setup.py, upload and things like this. So, um, devpy served indexes. One of the main purposes at the beginning, that was before PyPyPython.org grew a content delivery network, was that you can have a local um, self-updating PyP cache. So you basically work against your local index. If a package is not there, it goes off to PyPyPython.org, grabs it, and the next time you don't even need to be online, you don't even need to have online connectivity, it will just satisfy everything completely offline from your local cache. So everything that you install basically gets cached, including the index information, and it uses the changelog protocol with PyPI so that it, from time to time it asks PyPy, is there anything new for the projects I care for? If so, it basically invalidates the cache, so the next time you ask, it's going to um, update the cache. As with every cache, cache invalidation is a very important topic, and this is actually using the official PEP381 API. It also manages multiple private indexes for you, if you want to implement staging. And each of these indexes um, supports um, running against it with pip or easy install or build out, and it supports the typical um, setup by upload, upload docs, and so on commands uh, how you can then get packages into um, DevPy. Staging, um, there's one feature that distinguishes um, DevPI from other things, uh, other indexes that you may know, in that it provides an aggregation or inheritance feature. So here, this is one possible layout that some people use. Um, you have the so-called root PyPI, that's the cache, I talked about. You can directly use that if you don't care for private indexes and forget about the rest. But here we actually have a production index which contains the private indexes, uh, the private packages that you um, don't want to publish on PyPyPython.org, which, which might depend on PyPI um, 
release files that you don't have in your private index. So you may have um, a web application that depends on Pyramid, and Pyramid depends on lots of other things, and those all come from root PyPI. But if you work against the company production index, you're going to see one unified view of your private packages and all of the PyPI, Python org packages. And then if you want to do some kind of QA workflow, you um, also can do a development index, for example, team-based. That's what some companies are doing. And there you just put your in-development releases that are not ready to be deployed on your web servers maybe, but they can be used for further testing. And one important thing here is that um, your production index is actually somewhat protected from malicious PyPI packages. And I'm going to um, tell this, which is also interesting, if you don't use DevPI, something which I call the higher version attack. There's also variants of this attack. Let's say you have a credit card um, release file that contains your credit card processing in your web application. You put this on a private index, and somebody, that's the attacker actually, uploads credit cards with a slightly higher version number to PyPI. Now, if I, if I install against the, the, against the production index that inherits from root PyPI, with this install command, I'm actually going to get the PyPI version. Because I didn't know that somebody actually went and occupied my private name on PyPI. PyPI is a package wiki. Anybody can basically publish any kind of package. So if you have private package names that are not yet registered at PyPI, somebody can go there and do that. It's very easy. And the... Um, I don't know. I didn't try myself. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I could get, I guess, something like 100 bots per day or so with uh, something like this. That's not the only problem um, that is there, but um, I'm just saying that if you have something that somehow merges the world of the PyPy Python org wiki with your private indexes, then you, you get into this kind of problem. And that's also the case, actually, if you forget about DevP server, um, also the problem if you use pip install extra index URL, because then the merging is actually done on the client side but it does exactly that. It actually takes the higher version. So you, you end up, you thought you install something from your private index, but you're actually installing something from, from PyPI. So that's a bit of a problem. DevPI in version 2.0 prevents that because it says, by default, if you upload anything to a DevPI private index, any kind of further lookup, even if you inherit from the PyPI cache, will be prohibited. And you have to whitelist it. If you actually have a package that comes from PyPy Python org because it's an open source release of your company, then you have to whitelist it. Otherwise, all PyPI Py is ignored, basically. If you basically install from the production index credit cards and it's not whitelisted, so by default, PyPI is not considered because there is a package in your private index. So it's basically trying to prevent this kind of error. Um, but that's not the only way, if you want to be a bit more careful, because there's other attacks. Um, for example, if you, have, um, if you have typos, somebody in your company on their laptops installing Pyramid without a D at the end, or, uh, but I do sometimes pip install PyTest. So if you want to get hold of my machine, it's very easy, because you just need to register the package PyTest without the T. For some reason, I sometimes forget this uh, last letter. It's not currently registered, so it's a good chance uh, to get my machine. Um, so if you actually want to, this is really a problem, because I mean, you can imagine there's some very popular packages. If you, if you register variants of this kind of package names, you will eventually, from the millions of users, literally across the world, you will get some people actually. And I checked with the uh, PyP admins, um, there are actually, you can see that in the server logs, there are actually a lot of instances of mistyped um, things, so it's clear you can actually exploit that. Okay, but this is not about attack vectors against PyPI. Would be a fun talk by itself. Um, this is about, if you want to be more careful, um, then you probably should not inherit directly, but you rather have 
root PyPI as the self-updating cache and you work with that in development, but then when you want to have a package in your, including dependencies in your company, you actually push it explicitly into your production index. And, the, sorry, in your, into your development index, right? And then basically you just push packages around the indices and that's something that DevPI makes easy or somewhat easy, easier. And you upload your own packages to company dev and you won't have any kind of these attack problems um, like typos and so on. Suddenly, if people, you, your production machines cannot be easily uh, compromised. Okay, this is just some background on how you can organize and what you should, might want to be careful about regarding indexes. Um, the, 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 the way how you can organize indexes for your teams and also maybe platform-specific indexes that contain wheels for your def deployment platforms and so on. There are several variants about this and kind of uh, best practices emerging, which are not yet documented, but this is kind of a start on this. So one feature that came up, uh, came out last week actually is replication, because that's what one funding company who actually gave some money for development for the open source development wanted to have, is that you can now run a DevP server in replication mode. That means the, the first command actually starts the server, it's the full command that you run on port 3000, and then you start a replica somewhere else. You, um, in this case, I just run it also on localhost. I specify that the server state goes into a separate directory, the replica one, and then I say, okay, my master actually is this, so the second invocation actually starts a replication instance. And this works by HTTP between the um, replica and master, and it maintains a full failover copy. So that when you actually upload something to the master, it's, you can also upload something to the replica, it has the full interface, and that will only complete if the package is also at the master. So at any point in time where you upload something, you will have it at least on two hosts. And um, all writes, it's a kind of like a simplified replication model, um, always go through the master. And that kind of um, seems to work quite well already, although there might be some bugs out loud last week. Um, I've been running it myself um, in instances, and now some companies are starting to use the replication also in their settings. The um, DevPy Web is the second big feature that came out last week, um, from mostly implemented from Florian. Where is he? There. Um, we have uh, refactored DevPy to use Pyramid um, everywhere, and DevPy Web actually is a very nice web interface now that shows you metadata and, and summary information, description and documentation. So it's your basically read the docs, uh, read the docs in the company, basically, uh, server as well. And um, maybe I'll show that quickly, so you... So this is my semi-public instance. This is like, for example, my development index. And one of the things you see that, for example, the DevP Server 201 release we did, that's the release file. And here you see um, tests that were performed on the various, uh, uh, on the truth platforms here, Win32 and Linux, on the different interpreters. And I can basically look into that and see that um, this was executed. And um, in the same way, of course, I would see if there's a failure somewhere. Also, if I have um, documentation, I can go in here, or I can just say, show me, okay, what do you know about DevPy and Jenkins? And that's a full index, uh, a full DevP server search. And then I see, okay, there's some um, links to that. And I get to the integration part um, with Jenkins on the DevPy documentation. And that, was, that is just there because I uploaded the documentation to the index. It gets unpacked, you get URLs for that and it's indexed in the, in the search. So that's also a quite <clears throat> powerful um, facility. So the last component um, is DevPy Client. Um, it's a relatively thin wrapper around um, pip and some setup pi uh, invocations. 
It also performs the actual upload, so it always uh, uses SSL and some other bits. And um, it maintains on your local machine any kind of login information. So you basically say, okay, I log in, and then I um, use a certain index, I upload something, and then I don't need to re-log in all the time because that token I get from the server is going to be valid for 10 hours, and DevP Client basically stores this temporary authentication information. It also has experimental support now for SSL client certifications. If you want to step up your um, scenario um, to have uh, encryption and authentication through SSL. The commands that DevP Client offers are used to actually set the index you want to work on, development or just root PyPI or your production server. Upload is for helping you with the uploading files and docs and so on from a checkout. Test is the one that produces the test. It invokes tox actually. And push is the operation that actually pushes a release, including all of its documentation and release files from one index to the other. And pip or other installers you can just directly use. And then there's some configuration administration commands that you can use for index configuration, user configuration. And um, also accessing the JSON interface. So DevP Server has a full JSON interface on all of the resources that you can use for scripting. Um, a typical release workflow is, uh, looks like this. You basically go to your development index, you upload a release file, either you implicitly build, because you are in the setup.py directory, you just implicitly build with DevPy upload, or you already have built your release file, then you just say DevPy upload this release file, and you send it off to the index. And then from the same machine or from all kinds of other machines that you might manage with Jenkins or something, you issue this single line DevPy test package name, and that actually gets the latest release and performs the tests and attaches the test results back to the release file. That's why I could see in this web view, okay, this release file, what kind of tests has it seen? That was produced by this um, client-side devpy test command. And when it's ready, actually, when you are happy, then you push it to another index. And of course, you can also um, automate this kind of like in a Jenkins job and just invoke these commands to on success of something, post it to an index that says, this, these are all the test, the test passing packages and things like this. Um, so, this is a release file working that gets slide um, shortly into Tox. Um, Tox is um, a tool that allows to define how you want to, what kind of tests you want to do against your release file. It's basically in the release file, it expects to find a Tox.ini, and then it invokes Tox. I have a the next slide discusses what that means. It produces something called toxresult.json. And um, then I can actually, from the command line, I can say devpy list the package name and see what the status is, uh, if it was tests passed or what kind of test failures there were, and show me the traceback from the command line. And then I take the, the release file once I'm happy with it. This is then pu pushed bit by bit verbatim to the next index. So I know that this thing I actually tested against on the different platforms um, actually works. And I put this thing, I don't basically re-upload something to production. I really take the same thing that works and push it through to the next stage. Um, talks for automating test runs. Um, it's kind of a standardized testing. I'm not going to talk much about this because my slot was exchanged for a 30 minute um, talk. It was originally a 45 minute talk. Um, was scheduled wrongly, so I can't talk too much about it here. Um, but you can go to the um, web page to actually get some more information about how you configure your test runs with different test runners. The um, server, you already saw that you basically just install DevP server. You uh, have the typical host port and some other settings that you can, um, and the data idea where you want to have your server state. And then from, uh, from different clients that don't need to install DevP server, of course, you can uh, just install DevP client and then say DevPy use my company server and just work against that. Um, what you usually want to do is that you want to have an Nginx-based deployment. There's a, an example file that gets generated from your settings 
host port and so on and so on, which is basically a more or less complete Nginx or basic Nginx site config file that you can just include in your Nginx configuration or use as a template to work further from. And it's, uh, this actually happens in such a way that Nginx directly serves the static files. So some things actually DevP server doesn't see anymore. Once you upload something, the whole URL structure is such that the Nginx directly serves that file. So um, for that, um, DevP server doesn't even need to be running. Um, so I'm going to conclude. The DevPy system is um, developed since about a bit more than a year, I think, a year and a couple of months. It's MIT licensed. It's uh, test-driven development a lot, surprisingly. And um, also, it's a bit funding-driven. So there are some use cases that are interesting to me, myself, personally. But it also depends. I mean, one of the upcoming things maybe is a company who uh, funds some LDAP integration, authentication integration, but kind of like feature development and some things um, and consulting is provided by Florian and me. And of course, pull requests are a good way to contribute. Okay, that's uh, my brief overview of our DevPy and Talks. Thank you. Okay, we have a good five minutes of questions. You just briefly talked about LDAP authentication. Uh, does that mean that you can integrate DevPy into an Active Directory domain and use this information to authenticate users? Well, if the funding realizes, I guess so. Okay. <laughs> Uh, then I uh, ask my employee if he can uh, give you some money. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yes, I mean, a sprint or something like this is also uh, possible, but even a sprint, I mean, uh, you know, takes some time and organization. And, and get, in order to get something release ready and documented and everything, I mean, you probably know that, that it's kind of some work involved, right? And But just to give you a brief... Um, idea on how the, the feature discussion around LDAP is currently um, such that we say we want to have um, we want basically want to have Engine X deal with LDAP server integration and just pass a certain um, user name header and group header into DevP server and basically have an option in DevP server that just says okay my upstream Engine X is going to pass me the right thing and Engine X does the integration because there's nice plugins for Engine X that actually do this. And then we need some client-side support to handle the login part. But that's kind of like the current uh, implementation plan. Um, the, other, the alternative, obviously, is to actually have direct LDAP support in DevPI server itself. But, well, we don't have to reinvent every wheel, I guess. <laughs> yes? Hey, thanks for, uh, for all this uh, hard work you've done. And the question is about um, the testing by uh, testing run by DevPy server. In particular, um, is it possible to configure some workers which are remote to the server itself because it's a bit uh, mm -hmm. kind of overload for the for the, for the mm -hmm. server? Yes, I mean maybe I wasn't clear enough. The um, the server and the running of the tests, for example, they are completely separated. So where you issue DevPy test is completely separate from where the server runs. It, the devpy test command goes to the server and gets the files, performs the testing on whatever host, and then attaches back the test results. So on the devpy server instance itself, where the server runs, there's nothing. There's no, there's no setup.py or anything ever executing. Otherwise, it would be balked by... Uh, I mean, if you have to execute something like setup.py, you basically uh, run risk of um, compromise. Yes? No, no, the pushing is really after you test it. You test, like what you saw in this, um, the upload. Well, the upload you also do on the client machine. I mean, the client machine does the building and uh, like you do a wheel, for example, for Linux, Ubuntu, 14.4, 64-bit, blah, blah, UCS2, hmm, whatever your platform is. And then you actually upload the resulting file to maybe a platform-specific wheel index. Uh, 
No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Although there is an upload trigger, so if you upload, you can define on a per index basis. I mean, I didn't talk about all the features. You can per index actually, if you upload something, it can, for example, trigger a Jenkins job. That's kind of like one path that is documented. I showed it. You just go to um, the documentation and then the MISC se section about the Jenkins integration. Um, okay, you already uh, answered my question. I already have um, about a plugin system, system or signaling uh, stuff uh, like this Jenkins uh, plugin. Mm -hmm. um, is it already as generic as I can maybe uh, generate Debian files uh, from this upload trigger? No. I mean, DevPy tries to solve a few problems, but only those. It's not yet something like, it doesn't have like all kinds of events. It has this upload trigger for Jenkins, but not a generic webhook, whatever. So, I mean, that's not very hard to do, but it's basically very much, um, DevPy is very much driven by actual real world use cases, not by uh, all the features I can possibly think of or so. Well, so when somebody actually comes along and wants to have a certain feature and you know discusses the use case, it's, it's much more likely that it gets implemented. That's kind of like my general development approach these days. Okay, one more or? Okay, then that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.